Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon. How are you? Hope you're travelling all well. Uh, welcome to the ACNC's March webinar. We are looking today at conflicts of interest and related party transactions. These issues remain among the most problematic and commonly encountered for charities of all shapes and sizes. My name is Chris Richards. I'm part of the ACNC's education team. Joining us today is Peter McCarrow. He is part of the ACNC's compliance team. Hi Peter, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thanks Chris, and hello to everyone joining us today. Um, look, it's good to have someone with us from compliance as well, um, given that conflicts of interest uh, is something that, that they often encounter and hear about during their sort of role with the ACNC. Um, it is a really common issue that, that charities encounter, isn't it, Peter? It certainly is, Chris, and from the compliance side of the ACNC, we often find that when a charity goes off track, it's due to its failure to manage conflicts of interests of its responsible persons, or in other words, board members or committee members. Um, that can also lead to problems with its financial management and ultimately damage to its reputation. So it's critically important for a charity's board to make sure that they have effective policies and processes to identify, record and manage conflicts of interest and that yeah. each board member understands what they have to do. Definitely, and look, these are some of the things we're going to be going through in detail in today. So, um, our aim will be to help, obviously, to help um, help charities uh, do the right thing in this area and 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 go through the processes that they require. Um, before we launch in and start the old slideshow, a couple of housekeeping points, as is the use. If you've got any issues with the webinar audio, um, you can go uh, and, and have a listen through your phone um, and call the number listed in the email you'll have received during sign up. Um, put in the access code and listen to the webinar that way. Uh, during proceedings today, you can type a question uh, at any time. We have Bree, Matt and Michael helping us out and responding. One thing we will say though, um, in our session today, if your charity or, or yourself has a specific question, very specific to your charity, your organisation, um, we probably are not going to be able to answer it today just in our general chat. Best bet would be to um, get in touch with us directly um, through uh, 132262, which is 13ACNC, give us a call. Um, Clearly, because then you can go through some more detail uh, with our um, our staff, uh, who would be able to, I guess, guide you in the right direction. Um, also, if you do have a general question and it isn't answered today, feel free to email us afterwards. Uh, education at acnc.gov.au is the uh, is the address to go to. We're recording this webinar as we always do. The recording, as well as the slides, uh, they'll be published on the ACNC website within the next day or so. Um, our presentation has been included as a handout um, to those who uh, have registered. Uh, we'll send an email out afterwards um, with links to the presentation as well as um, uh, to uh, relevant websites uh, around the, the ACNC site as well, or sorry, relevant web pages. Um, we've also made a, available a handout with a list of some of those spots on the site that are most appropriate. So again, um, access the handouts through to the through the GoToWebinar interface, um, and you'll be able to have a look at them. So, and finally, too, we value feedback as always. Um, if you have any suggestions for ways that we can improve our webinars, uh, let us know in the short survey at the end of uh, today's proceedings. So now, there we go. We uh, we slide on through to the next slide. What's on the agenda? Uh, as you can see, there's a quick rundown of some of the general areas we'll be covering. We're going to start with the basic question of what is a conflict of interest um, and endeavour to explain it in pretty clear and concise terms. Our focus today is, of course, on conflicts of interest relating to charity responsible people um, and the impacts they can have. Um, as we've said before, these conflicts can be uh, relatively common. We'll also look at different types of conflicts of interest. There's financial, non-financial, personal, uh, and we're also going to look at some of the stages of conflicts of interest, actual, potential and perceived, what they mean and some of the differences uh, between them. We'll work some coverage of related party transactions into proceedings as well. And we're going to provide some reference to the ACNC's governance standards and how they relate to conflicts of interest with governance standard five uh, particularly relevant here. What else, are we, what else are we up to today, Peter? 
Well, the rest of the main content of today's webinar, Chris, will focus on some very practical things uh, your charity can do in this area. We'll look at how charities can identify conflicts of interest, as well as some of the common problem areas and issues that we at the ACNC see in this area. And finally, to finish up, we'll examine the ways charities can properly and meaningfully manage conflicts of interest so they don't become a bigger issue than what they should be. Definitely. Um, now, before we before we launch in, um, quick little mention here of our guide, uh, Managing Conflicts of Interest. It's a really good guide. Uh, there's the link there uh, on your screen. Um, importantly, we will endeavour to try and in the chat uh, today, um, we will try and get those links uh, put into the chat as well throughout um, so that you can access them and you have access to them. But obviously the links are all going to be included in the, uh, in the bits and pieces that we'll be getting out to you after the webinar is done. Um, this guide is a very practical guide um, and, and helps you, uh, I guess, approach identifying conflicts of interest and managing them in, in the best possible way. If you haven't had a look, go have a look. It's, a, it's, a, it's well worth bookmarking, well worth keeping handy. Um, let's start with the basic question. What is a conflict of interest? What's a conflict of interest, Peter? Well, a conflict of interest in, in the charity context at least occurs when a, a board member's personal interests are in conflict with their ability to act in the best interest of the charity uh, which they are a part of. And look, I think a good way to think about it is like a Venn diagram. And there you can see one on the screen uh, where a person's charity life and their normal or personal life cross over. Where those circles intersect, that's where a conflict of interest can occur. Yeah, and look, what's important to note here is that the idea of an interest isn't necessarily just one that an individual may have themselves. Um, an interest may also involve for example, family, friends, other organisations they are involved with. Uh, it might include people that you work for or work with, uh, or even another charity or community organisation you're a part of. Um, all these things are interests and they have the potential to be in conflict with the best interests of the charity that you are responsible for or you're a responsible person on or serve. That's right, and, and to follow this up, and this is something that's important to emphasise, conflicts of interest in and of themselves are neither positive or negative. So often the phrase, that person has a conflict of interest is uttered and the instant connotation is a negative one. But when that phrase is said, what's usually meant is a little bit more involved than that. It might be that person has a conflict of interest and something else, for example, and is letting it influence their decision making, or they haven't declared it or dealt with it, or they're still involved in the decision when they shouldn't be. What we're getting at here is this, a conflict of interest is itself neither positive or negative. The important part is how it affects the charity and how you deal with it. And what makes a conflict of interest potentially a problem is when it's not managed properly, when there are not proper procedures, policies and processes to address it. Yeah, and look, the, this is definitely something to emphasise here. Um, and it's not necessarily the conflict of interest as Peter explains, it's how it's managed and how it's, I guess, um, overseen uh, that can make it into an issue. Um, and, and look, as we know, conflicts of interest are pretty common. Um, most of us have got a conflict of interest at some point somewhere in our, in our lives, I suppose. Um, in, a, in a charity sense, um, you might have, say, people in, in small towns, rural, regional areas, where there are simply fewer people um, and th they can often run into conflicts of interest because they might have roles or responsibilities in a variety of organisations. They might be involved in a charity, in a community organisation, in business, um, all of those sorts of things. They have fingers in quite a few pies, I suppose you would say. Another example might be in a field or maybe a specialist area where there are a smaller pool of involved people, um, meaning that simply just odds are that you and have some crossovers between people's interests. Um, again, conflicts of interest don't have to be a problem as long as your charity has ways to manage and address them properly. That's uh, right, uh, Chris. And look, um, there are obviously different ways that uh, um, that these crossovers between different parts of our lives can can cause um, issues. And 
let's go through some of the major ones. Um, the first is a conflict due to a direct financial interest. This is probably the most obvious one that people are familiar with and the most people most people think about when a phrase like conflict, conflict of interest is mentioned. It's when a person might receive a direct financial benefit as a result of a decision or action by the board of your charity. And look, a simple example might be the charity choosing to use a company that one of its uh, responsible people or its directors has a financial interest in for some work. That director then benefits from the decision to use that company for the work. And look, we've got a little bit of an example here. Let's say Sally is on the Committee of Community Helps, a, a charity that works with local youth. She's also a freelance web developer in her professional life and Community Helps needs a new website. So she does a bit of lobbying and she convinces the rest of the committee to engage her professional services for the new website. And I guess with my compliance hat on, Chris, I would say that procurement or employment decisions like Community Helps decision to employ Sally and her company are one of the high risk areas for conflicts of interest. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now we've, we've looked at direct financial interest and there was a little bit of an example there, so that's actually excellent. We look at an indirect financial interest. Now, it's similar to the first one, but the financial benefit may not necessarily just go to the involved individual. It might go to a family friend, family member, uh, another organisation that you're linked to or friends with, I suppose. Um, now, we've got a little bit of an example here uh, and, and we'll we'll go through this is drawn from our conflicts of interest guide that we that we mentioned earlier on um, as you can see south school it's a small private girls school last year the school board decided to open a canteen at the school's campus all normal all usual jenny is a director of south school she told the board that she'd heard of a cheap wholesaler called food for less which could stock the canteen with healthy and 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 uh cost effective low price food now, Jenny's sister owns a share in Food for Less. As a result, Jenny has an indirect financial interest in South School's contract or its decision to, uh, to go with Food for Less. So this is a conflict of interest, but one that's indirect. Now, Jenny isn't benefiting directly in this situation, but her family and, and her sister is. So this is an indirect conflict of interest. Still a conflict of interest, but a different type. Um, now, we've got another one here. Peter, what's what's that one? Uh, yes, Chris, look, the third type of conflict is a non-financial or personal conflict. And not all conflicts of interest are about money. Um, arguably, the more obvious ones are, but not all of them are. Um, this type of non-financial or personal conflict might arise where, say, a proposed board decision of a charity you are involved in sees family or friends receive a non-financial benefit they wouldn't otherwise be entitled to receive. For example, they might get some good publicity for their business or perhaps a, a bit of a boost to their, 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 their reputation. Um, it could be something significant. It might be something that would be deemed a simple favour. Favour, either way, it is a conflict. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it, it, this idea that it might just be something small, it's still a conflict. Um, and, and it's important to note that. So that's the third one. Fourth one, conflict of loyalties. Um, now we know, clearly we know through the ACNC that a lot of people um, are on, uh, who are on charity boards, who are responsible people with charities um, are on boards or, or are part of, um, I guess, other charities. Um, and a conflict of loyalties can occur when two sets of loyalties you know, to uh, to different organisations or different charities uh, intersect. Now, we've got another example here, Peter. I'll, I'll throw to you to go through this one. Yes, Chris, there's an example of um, conflict of loyalties. And we look at uh, mental health advocates. It's a charity with the purpose to improve the quality of mental health services. And the charity is considering funding 10 practitioner positions at hospitals. And one of the uh, the candidate hospitals for the funded position is the Central Children's Hospital. And Nellie, who's a board member of Mental Health Advocates, is also a board member at Central Children's Hospital. Now, in this little scenario, you can see the quandary that Nellie might be in with split loyalties in her duties to mental health advocates to award the funding, 
or subsidy them to the most in need hospital and her duties to the children's hospital and improving its services. What if the children's hospital isn't in the most need category and others should be in front of it for funding? Well, Nellie has here some divided loyalties. Her duties to two different organisations have come together and clashed, creating a conflict of interest that needs to be addressed. Definitely, uh, definitely. Now, we've gone through the four different types of conflict of interest here. There, there are also some different stages of conflicts of interest as well. Um, we at the ACNC like to distinguish between these these different different forms, different stages, um, and, and we look at them as as actual, potential, and perceived. Um, now, to illustrate these, again, we're going to go through some examples and some some examples and some scenarios. He says, getting tongue tied, um, and uh, we'll start with an actual conflict of interest, which again is is the one that's familiar to I guess most people. It's when a person actually is being influenced by a competing interest when in a role with their charity. Um, for example, you know, your charity might be considering, considering some contracts for some work. One of the potential service providers is run by the family of a committee member. The committee member is going to be involved in the process to decide who gets the contract, the decision-making process. That's pretty obvious. Look, that's for the most part, very clear. The conflict of interest is, is clear and it is actual. Um, the charity's responsible person helping make a decision on a contract that could go to a company run by their own family is a, is a pretty clear conflict. Um, and it's right in front of people's face. Uh, it, it really questions the ability of, a, of the person in question to, I, I guess, act impartially in the decision-making process. Um, now, the next stage of, of, uh, of conflict is uh, the potential one, isn't it, Peter? Yes, Chris, this is where the uh, where is the possibility, the potential, if you like, that a person could be influenced by a conflicting or competing uh, interest. Again, uh, we've got another example. Uh, John, who's a responsible person at Charity A, takes on a job in a professional capacity with another charity, Charity B which provides similar services to Charity A. Now, Charity B is having some issues with its IT systems, and John is asked to oversee a contract to sort out these problems. Now, look, on the surface, this situation may not be a massive red flag in itself, but John's knowledge of Charity B's infrastructure and work could lead to a conflict with his role in Charity A. There's a potential for the situation to lead to a conflict. And that's the important thing here, the potential of there being a conflict. It could turn into an actual conflict of interest quickly. So this potential conflict needs to be identified and addressed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And the third um, stage of conflicts of interest is a perceived one. Um, a perceived conflict of interest that someone could appear to be influenced by a conflicting interest. It may not be an actual conflict of interest. It may never even become a conflict of interest, but to someone looking in from the outside, looking through the window, um, there is a perception and a very real perception perhaps that there is a conflicting interest at play in, in a certain situation. Um, and this perception is, a lot, uh, is important to consider just in itself. Um, now again, we, we, we have another example and I've preempted the next slide but uh, we have another example um peter did you want to did you want to yes. uh, tell us in on that one yes look um uh, these um uh, these sorts are um are quite challenging but let's give an example uh, a charity's responsible people are making a decision on an organization to partner with to deliver a program the charity has five responsible people that will meet and vote on a partner organization the charity has a specially uh, appointed group that is responsible for looking at each organisation's proposals and making a recommendation that will go to the responsible people for voting on. Now, while the responsible people themselves are not directly evaluating the proposals, one of them has a son in a prominent position in one of the organisations being considered. The responsible person in question, of course, has only one vote out of five, and the decision is being made by others. But what if it turns out that the recommendation is to go with their son's organisation? and they have to vote to approve the recommendation. From the outside um, perspective, the first impression or perception, if you like, might be that something isn't quite right, that there might be influence being wielded due to the conflict of interest involved. It isn't a good look, 
and even if there are no actual issues, the perception is there. That's a perceived conflict of interest and it too needs to be addressed. And Chris, if I can just say with my compliance hat on, um, perceived conflicts of interest can be quite challenging for charities to identify and manage. And I mm. guess in this case, they've done the right thing, um, but some people might um, might not see it that way. So it's important to sort of um, think about those risks of how people look at things or how they perceive them. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, definitely. And look, um, we will be in a second launching into some of the some of the ways and some of the techniques and, and, and bits and pieces where charities can manage and identify and, and work through um, some of these some of these issues and particularly these perceived ones. Um, and and I guess uh, the the disclosure of these sorts of uh, these sorts of issues is is a key step in that. Um, so look, we've looked at actual and potential and perceived, the three types of, of conflicts of interest. As you can see through some of the examples, while you might believe there's no danger uh, of you, say, making a decision based on your own personal interest rather than the, the charity's best interests, this doesn't mean the conflict of interest should be disregarded. Um, and it's important to take all conflicts of interest seriously. Now, this leads us into a quick look at related parties. And there's the correct slide at the correct time. Related party transactions. Um, here's a quick overview of, of what these terms mean and, and, a, and a quick little look at an example. Um, interestingly, the terms aren't actually defined in the legislation that established the ACNC. The definition we use comes through the Australian Accounting Standards Board, the AASB. In a charity complex, the com, context, sorry, a related party is something, a person, a group, organisation that has a pre-existing relationship with the charity. Um, now, what is a related party transaction, Peter? Well, look, a related party transaction occurs when there are dealings or, if you like, transactions between parties that have a pre-existing relationship. And I think we've got a um, an example uh, on the next uh, slide, or we'll talk about it. And yeah. look, there are some very good examples. Um, of related party transactions on the um, related party page of, of our website. Um, but perhaps the most common example in this context is when a charity responsible person has ties to another business or organisation, either directly or through family perhaps. So this means the business or organisation is a related party to the charity. And obviously a related party transaction is one that occurs when there are dealings between related parties. That's exactly right. Um, and I mean, we've we've hinted and mentioned this already about, you know, ties between a charity and say a responsible person's business or, or that sort of thing. Um, and it, it, look, an, ex, a, an example here, a charity is planning to uh, establish a new facility for its services. One of the companies being considered for work on the new facility um, is managed by the daughter of a director of the, of the charity. Um, this service has been identified as a potential related party transaction and a conflict of interest. Um, so you can see how related party transactions are in, in this way clearly linked to conflicts of interest. Um, and look, like the other types, like conflicts of interest clearly, um, th this must be addressed. Now, we've got our lovely little cogs here. One of them does say rules and another one says compliance. Um, the ACNC's governance standards do directly refer to conflicts of interest. We mentioned that related parties weren't directly referred to, but conflicts of interest are. And that is done, I guess, uh, most, uh, most specifically through governance standard five, which we'll get to in a second. Um, the charities registered with the ACNC must adhere to our governance standards. So that means that the proper identification, disclosure and management of conflicts of interest is a must. And I mentioned Governance Standard 5. Peter, um, if you could just maybe go through and provide a couple of details about what Governance Standard 5 uh, says. Yes, look, Chris, this is the sort of the um, uh, a critical governance standards and uh, um, it covers um, what responsible persons must do and what their duties are. And that includes um, to act with reasonable care and diligence, uh, not to misuse their position as responsible person, not to misuse information obtained while uh, performing their duties, uh, act honestly in the best interests of the charity and for its purposes, and there we go, disclose any actual or perceived conflict of interest. 
And um, it's the last point where we have a direct reference to disclosing actual or perceived conflicts. But any of these five points can be related back to disclosing and managing conflicts of interest properly. Uh, properly doing so means responsible people are acting with reasonable care and diligence. So for example, you have a conflict of interest policy, uh, that's something uh, part of your duty to uh, act with care and diligence. Um, and you're uh, taking steps uh, uh, towards not misusing uh, their position and are acting honestly in the best interests of the charity and for its purposes. And this again is really coming back to the whole point about putting the charity's interests and purposes first above personal interests. Yeah, yeah. And um, look, as we've said, conflicts of interest are among the most common issues we see affecting charities and they have the potential um, to cause a lot of damage to individual charities, to, to their people, to beneficiaries, to the sector even as, as a whole. Um, now, what what are some of these threats? Um, I'll, I'll throw to you for the first couple, Peter. Yeah. Yes, look, Chris, the most significant threats are risk of uh, damaging a charity's good governance. And uh, the most important responsibility of any board and responsible members on the board is to ensure that it always acts uh, in the interest of the organisation it governs. And uh, the failure to manage conflicts of interest indicates that the charity's board or some members of it are not acting in the charity's best interest. Um, if a charity's responsible people let conflict of interest sway their decision-making and actions, if they are putting their own interests ahead of the charities, then that can mean decisions aren't in the charity's best interests and can really start to compromise its sustainability and future direction. Yeah, and if a board or committee has some people that are not acting in the best interests of the charity, um, you know, not making decisions in the charity's best interests, um, the board and its dynamics are affected, uh, no doubt. Um, board and committee decision making relies on open, honest, impartial discussions, um, and that leads to impartial and informed decisions. Board members should be able to rely on their colleagues always acting in the best interest of the charity and should be able to rely on them in the way of, I guess, participating in open and honest discussion based on this assumption. Having a conflict of interest that influences these things, and for example, not declaring and managing the conflict, it risks the integrity and, and the effectiveness of the, the collective decision-making process that a board or a committee goes through. Um, and improperly managed conflicts of interest can undermine the confidence of board members um, and, and look, they can, it can be damaging to, to trust uh, between them, definitely. Uh, what, else have that, we, what else have we got, Peter? Yeah, look, that's, that's right, Chris. And look, char charity transparency and accountability are key components of good governance. And again, conflicts of interest can cause problems here. Um, when an organisation demonstrates transparency, it's being open and honest about its work, including about its decisions, uh, its operations, and transactions, and you can't have accountability without transparency. Um, if a charity board member doesn't disclose a conflict of interest, they're not being open, frank, and honest about their personal interest in a decision before the board. There's no transparency there. And this in turn prevents in interested stakeholders, such as members uh, of the charity or even other people on the board from being able to scrutinise the decision and hold people accountable. This means there's no accountability. Board members being held responsible by the people who have an interest in the charity, its staff, members, beneficiaries, funders, and the general community. Well, how can people, for example, charity members, for example, have confidence in decisions being made when there is a lack of transparency about conflicts of interest and their possible influence on those making the decisions? That's why appropriately identifying and managing conflicts of interest is essential in promoting accountability and transparency in your charity. And in a few minutes, we'll explore ways to do that. Chris? Yeah, look, we will, yeah. Um, there's two of the key words there, identifying and managing uh, in terms of conflicts of interest. Um, look, in these ways, as you've seen here, some of these threats, the conflicts of interest pose a very real risk to the reputation of a charity. Um, if a charity doesn't manage conflicts of interest properly and transparently, or transparently, goodness, where does that mean charity stakeholders? What, well, I guess, what does it mean 
uh, for members, for donors, supporters, volunteers? What, where does that leave them? What, what do they end up thinking? Um, maybe that decisions are not being made in the best interests of the charity, that responsible people are not acting in a proper manner, perhaps, or, or with due diligence, with expertise, um, or that maybe to put it a bit more bluntly, there might be something dodgy happening. So the potential hit on your charity's reputation can have some very real impacts on the support you have in the community. Um, now we do have again a bit of an example to talk through here, um, which we've we've peppered throughout uh, proceedings today. But I guess what are some of the real life issues and common problems we at the ACNC see in relation to conflicts of interest? Um, Peter, these are the sorts of things that that yourself with your compliance hat on might see um, when we're looking into a concern about a charity, um, aren't they? That's right, Chris. And look, it's interesting. Um, the, the ACNC is not the only organisation concerned about how charities manage conflicts of interest. Uh, nowadays, many government funding and accreditation bodies are requiring charities to show they have good governance processes, including processes to identify and manage conflicts of interest. And we yeah. often come across uh, um, uh, you know, situations where charities funding or accreditation is endangered because they, uh, they don't have their governance, they don't have their conflicts of interest uh, in order. And that can be a real risk to a charity's uh, funding and uh, ability to carry on its work. And look, Chris, I guess I'm no expert, but um, uh, I would have thought that um, if, you're, if you're bidding for corporate sponsorship these days, uh, if you have your governance and you have your conflicts of interest tied down and, uh, and compliant, then you've got a much better chance, I would have thought, of uh, getting the money from those big donors that'll have confidence in you. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very important factor as well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm nodding vigorously here in my, my experience, I agree with you 100% when you're looking and, and applying for grants, looking for funding and sponsorships increasingly and perhaps rightly so. There, these funders, these um, organisations are looking uh, not only at your proposal obviously, but at your organisation as a whole and are looking to see well, you know, what, what processes do you have in place? Are you well run? We're not just going to throw you some money and have you run with it and not do things properly. So there's that, that responsibility there and, and things like conflicts of interest and, and, and the processes that a, a charity has, um, as you say, Peter, are not only crucial in terms of ACNC, but crucial in terms of a whole heap of other charity operations and um, approaches for funding and support and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so look, we look here on the screen, uh, we've got some, I guess, a few bullet points here of some of the, the, the common problems that we see at the ACNC. Um, the first one here is that firms or companies linked to charities, responsible people who might be providing goods or services to that charity. Um, now there's an issue there if the processes uh, that the charity has gone through to procure those services aren't transparent. And I mean, Peter, you, you mentioned this a few minutes ago, this being a, a, a common issue. Yes, Chris, this is one of the, um, the probably more common issues, the procurement of goods or services from relatives or friends of the charity's responsible persons, uh, the sort of related party transactions we spoke about earlier. And this is where a charity can go off track for a few reasons. One, the charity doesn't test the market for the goods or services, so there's no way of knowing if the arrangement is actually in the charity's financial interest. Could they have got a better deal, or better qualified person elsewhere? And the second reason, of course, is conflict of interest. Other board members may be uneasy about the arrangement. If there's no conflict of interest policy or procedure, it may be difficult to challenge the responsible person whose relative is getting the contract. And when we go to ask a charity how it came to a decision like this, there may be no records or board minutes of any discussion to show that they uh, they acted with care and diligence, thought about yeah. conflicts of interest or what the best interests of the charity were. Definitely, and and you mentioned you mentioned records there and and uh, and minutes and those sorts of things, and this is something that we'll we'll get to in the next uh, next uh, twenty to uh, twenty five minutes. Um, look. Uh, the next, I guess, bullet point here is that, you know, and uh, responsible people themselves uh, or their or, you know, family members of responsible people <clears throat> are actually employed by the charity. Um, it's another one that we, we see a bit of. Again, Peter, what are some of the issues here 
uh, in relation to, to conflict of interest? Yes, look, it's not uncommon common to see uh, some charities employing uh, responsible persons, family members. I mean, look, there's nothing uh, to prevent that, uh, uh, but there are big risks, um, not the least of which is managing that conflict of interest and making sure that the recruitment process is fair and transparent. And this is definitely a case where a responsible person who's um, involved or has a family member applying for a job um, should immediately disclose that conflict. And uh, sometimes we also see responsible persons, family members being remunerated, perhaps quite generously, but no yeah. clear evidence of how they those pay and conditions were appropriate. And um, so this lack of transparency is, is a bit of a recipe for poor governance, um, unmanaged conflicts of interest and, and ultimately reputational risk. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now the third point here is, we've got two words here, mixing money as we as we call it. Now this is something that again can become problematic for charities. What, um, from from an ACNC perspective, what do we, what do we see here, Peter? Well, look, sometimes we see charity uh, responsible persons mixing their personal funds with the charities by purchasing items for the charity on their own personal credit card or using the charity's card to buy items for their personal use. And there's a clear conflict of interest in using <coughs> charity funds for personal purposes uh, and using personal credit cards for charity purchases can also result in quite significant benefits um, to the card holder through accumulating reward points and other benefits. Um, yeah. not, to, not to mention the challenges of uh, recording, documenting and uh, acquitting those sorts of transactions. So the lesson there is uh, always keep charity money in accounts entirely separate from personal funds and have a strict policy on, on how uh, you know you reimburse people if they do spend money. Yeah and the last one in this section again sort of financially related um, where responsible people might perhaps loan money to the charity. Um, where can the conflict of issue, interest issues turn, turn to or occur here, Peter? Yes, look, you know, this is um, um, not uncommon, but uh, certainly not, um, not particularly desirable. What, what yeah. tends to happen is that uh, a responsible person may loan some money to the charity and then not at a time of their own choosing, it tends to be not necessarily when it suits the charity or when it's in the charity's interest, they arrange for those funds to be re repaid to them. And uh, rarely do we find that these sort of arrangements, um, that, that conflicts of interest are documented or disclosed and, uh, and there's no often no formal agreement to uh, protect the charity's interest. And these sort of loose informal loan arrangements um, between a responsible person and the charity um, also give rise to issues about management of financial affairs as well. So yeah. not one to be encouraged. Definitely, definitely. Now look, we've we've gone through so far, looked at the, some of the basics, discussed some of the real life examples, looked at the different types, the different stages of, of conflicts of interest um, that we've come across in, you know, the, the role of the ACNC. Um, but how do charities identify conflicts of interest? What are some of the practical methods charities can use to, to look at the situation? Now this identification of conflicts of interest is a clearly a first key step in ensuring that you are addressing these issues in relation to conflicts of interest. So the first, I guess, couple of ways that you can, or a charity can look at, at, at um, conflicts of interest and, and, and identifying them is to be clear about your charity's purpose um, and, and your role in the charity. Um, now, if you're clear on your charity's purpose or mission, it provides a pretty useful starting point on whether an interest that you have as an individual might be in conflict with your duty to act in the best interests of your charity. And if you're clear on your role within the charity and the duties it entails, um, now that includes those that are spelled out in Governance Standard 5, you'll again have a greater context on whether any other interest that you might have conflicts with those duties. So there's two key starting points there. Um, what else have we got, Peter? Well, I think uh, charity uh, responsible persons should also be clear on, on their personal interests as well. And uh, not just their personal interests, but those of interest, those interests of those connected to them, friends, relatives, uh, and how these things might have the potential to influence them in their role with the charity. And uh, your interests, of course, 
no one's interests are set in stone, they can change over time. And some of the things that, you know, that people should think about is some, for example, the current and previous paid or volunteer work. Um, whether you're a board member of any other organisation, we've had a discussion about an example of that earlier, whether you own a business or a share in a business, um, membership of other organisations you hold and uh, any similar interests of your family or friends. And if there's a chance that these interests may conflict with the interests of the charity, either now or at some point in the future, you need to be aware of them and note them in what we call a register of interests and which we'll go into detail about in a few minutes, Chris. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, Re register of interest is something that we'll be discussing discussing pretty soon, actually. Um, look, another way to examine the situation um, is the question that we've got here. What would a reasonable person think? Um, if a reasonable person looked at a situation and had a bit of an examination of it. Would they believe that you are being influenced by a personal interest when making decisions on behalf of the charity? That's that's pretty much the, I guess, the test there in, in a way. Second test here is, as we've labelled it here, taking a step back. Um, consider stepping outside your organisation um, and taking a step back and viewing things from a different perspective. Maybe the perspective of the outsider looking in through the window. Um, you might think there is no conflict of interest, but if you take that step back and look at the situation as an outsider, that different perspective might prove to be very enlightening. It might become very clear that there's an issue and, and an issue that does need to be managed. So um, the, these two tests, I guess, as we call them, are, are pretty, pretty important. They're good ways of, of looking as well. Um, and people should remember to put on their charity hat rather than their individual or personal hat um, and examine the situation using perhaps these these uh, these approaches as well. Now That's we're right. on to disclosure, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're on to disclosure and this is, uh, this is the key thing. This is what uh, charity responsible persons must do if they have a conflict. And I guess, um, how do we, how do we go about doing this? Well, look, the, the most important thing is to have a conflict of interest policy. And this has to be a policy that, that clearly addresses conflicts of interest, how they're declared, how they're disclosed, how they're recorded and where they're recorded. And um, as is the way with all policies, um, uh, a conflict of interest policy needs to be a living document. It needs to be kept up to date. Um, so make sure you have a review date um, to have another look at it. Um, People need to know that it exists um, and aware of how it applies. It should be part of an induction program for any new board member and, uh, and even your existing responsible people probably might need to refresh their memory from time to time. Yeah. And it needs to be practical so that people can easily take up the steps to uh, comply through doing that disclosure. So don't, um, don't put it away in a drawer, keep it, uh, keep it handy at uh, your committee meetings because sometimes you might need to refer to it. Yeah, definitely. Now um, we'll go s slightly away from the, the slides for one second. We, we did have a, a query that, is, that has come through that is probably appropriate to perhaps have a look at uh, at this stage of our webinar. Um, someone has asked us about pro bono arrangements um, where there is clearly you know, no money being um, exchanged, but those pro bono ex arrangements may cause a little bit of an issue in terms of who they're with. They might be with a responsible person's, um, you know, uh, family members, for example. Um, now, even if there's no money being exchanged, you still have to declare this. I I'm, I'm, hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but um, you still do have to declare this, don't you? This is still something that you should declare um, and, and you should identify and disclose just to be safe. I agree. I, I, think, I don't think there's any reason why you wouldn't. Um, doing pro bono work uh, possibly gets you um, some kudos in the community, some advantage. Um, it, may, uh, it may be work that um, uh, somehow impinges on on the charity as well. Um, I don't think there's any danger in uh, uh, being open and uh, transparent, even if it is uh, voluntary or pro bono work. Yeah, definitely. It's just a matter of, I guess, 
identifying it and, and look obviously the person who's asked the question here has identified it as a possible issue so I mean that's the the massive first step um, to disclose it is something where you you're just doing the right thing you're just being safe um, you're just making sure you're going down the right path so mo most definitely that's that's the approach that, that should be should be taken here um, yes Christian and also yeah. I think not everyone may know it's pro bono um, so yeah, well, getting it out Getting yes. it down uh, registered with the charity, um, make sure there's a record there. And if anyone comes in and uh, makes any comments or criticism, there you have it, uh, it's being disclosed. Yeah, that's a very good point. Again, that's that looking in from the outside, um, taking a step back at what other people might see uh, approach uh, that comes into play here. Um, now we've mentioned a conflict of interest, po interest policy. Hand in hand with that is a register of interests. Um, it register of interest or an interest register, depending on how you wish to phrase it. It's a place where all interests, be they actual, perceived or potential, they are, they are formally noted uh, and they're placed on the record, really. A register of interest is the, is the place uh, to do this. Um, now, again, the register needs to be kept up to date uh, and the charity needs to decide who has access to this register and who can update it. Now that's important. You can't just have any old person coming in and updating it. There needs to be a bit of a process there that you know um, one or two people have access to the register, that any issues that need to be put on the register are put on by those people and that there might be some process of discussion as to what needs to go on the register and, and how someone declares it and puts it on the register, that sort of thing. So don't, it's not unfettered access. There should be a little bit of a limit on that sort of stuff. Um, now, the, this point here, disclosure at board level, is uh, key, I, I guess, board or committee level. Um, now, many charities might ask those with conflicts of interest to ensure that the board is aware of them as well. Um, now, this is in addition to them being on that interests register. Um, and a great way to achieve this is to go through and make sure that any declaration of interests or, or that sort of thing is a regular item on a meeting agenda, board meeting, committee meeting agenda. Doing so means that they can be declared publicly to others and made known. They can be noted down in the minutes that are taken. And again, it can be updated um, on your charity's interest register. Um, now there's some templates in our, the templates area of our website for a register of interests and for a conflict of interest policy. Um, I could read out the web addresses, I'm not going to. What I will do is, and what we will do is, we will ensure that the handout that will be, and the email that will be coming out um, after this webinar, will have links to those. Go and have a, ref a bit of a look at those, um, those templates. They are very useful. There are obviously other templates around the website and around uh, the World Wide Web as well. Um, go and have a bit of a look at them. Uh, and if you need to use one of those templates, then most definitely go for it. Um, now we've got just a couple more bullet points here and we're looking at I guess organisational culture here aren't we Peter? Absolutely Chris and this is uh, this is critical this is the key to uh, um, you know successfully governing your charity and managing conflicts of interest. Having an attitude that welcomes and encourages disclosure is, is a priority and yeah. uh, when you when you bring a new board member on, make sure that uh, um, they disclose those conflicts. They put it in that register uh, when they join, and explain also that it's not just a one-off thing. It has to be looked at um, um, virtually every time you have a meeting where you've got something on the agenda. Or, um, um, have a look to see whether you might have a conflict. And again, um, as we've said before, having a conflict of interest isn't a bad thing. Uh, people shouldn't be embarrassed to declare a conflict of interest. In fact, they have to. Um, yes. As we've explained, most members of a board will encounter a conflict of interest or maybe one or more at some point and uh, should feel confident to declare and manage it responsibly. And I guess, again, where I've seen this working very well, uh, Chris, is where uh, the chair of a charity um, really takes on that responsibility of, of setting that tone and setting that open and, uh, and transparent atmosphere uh, yeah. and culture uh, and, and setting those expectations about disclosure of conflicts. Yeah, that sort of leadership and that sort of tone setting is something that's that's very important. Um, and it's not only by in, in words and saying it, but also in by example as well. 
um, to to see that sort of thing in action is something that can make a lot of difference to other people on a on a board or a committee or or in a or in a charity, I suppose. Um, now we've looked at identifying first step, disclosing as a I guess the second step, third step, managing. So where you identify and disclose conflicts of interest, you also need to manage them. So again, there's a there's a few ways this can be done. Um, now this one we've touched on already. Uh, your charity's normal meetings are a very effective, very visible way for conflicts of interest to be managed uh, and, and to show publicly your charity's attitude towards disclosing conflicts of interest. Um, at the start of your regular board or committee meeting, you could ask if anyone has any conflicts of interest to, de to declare. Um, and that would be, I guess, linked to any items on the agenda. Uh, as an aside, look, this is another reason why it's important to get your meeting agendas organised and out to members uh, and board members well before scheduled meetings. It allows people to have a look at what's on the agenda and to have a bit of a think. Do I have a conflict of interest with this item or that item? And it just gives people that bit of time to reflect. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, the request to declare uh, conflicts of interest you know, regards any items on the agenda should be something that occurs at the top of each meeting. Uh, it's also a good idea for anyone with any conflicts of interest to again declare them immediately before the item is discussed. Um, in a past life as a journalist, I saw councils um, do this and council laws do this. They would declare an item at the top of the meeting and then when the agenda rolled around to that uh, item, maybe 45 minutes later, they'd stick their hand up again and say, yep, I've got a conflict of interest here. Uh, I need to just declare it again. Transparency, double lot of transparency. Uh, it's a good thing. Some organisations, some charities, are comfortable having people with the conflict of interest take part in the discussion about the relevant item and only have them leave the room while a decision or a vote occurs. Other organisations might prefer that person who has declared the conflict leave the room for both the discussion and the decision. Now, that's up to you. Uh, as a charity, your way forward is your way forward. Um, maybe having them leave the room for both might be an option if they believe or if there is a belief in the charity that an input to discussion uh, might still be useful you can pay, maybe do that but that's that's up to a charity to to, to decide on that one but these actions and they and they've got to be backed up by good minute taking um, and that should note any conflict of interest declarations who has voted who's not voted on certain items all of that sort of stuff um, these are very public shows of transparency uh, and they're a massive way of showing how you are managing and dealing with, with conflicts of interest. Uh, that's, what have that's we got right, Chris. Oh, policy. Yes. Yeah. yeah, look, Chris, that's right, your last point. I mean, certainly from the compliance point of view, when we see board minutes where people have obviously declared conflicts of interest, they've been properly recorded. That gives us a lot more confidence that the charity's on the right track and uh, and doing the right thing. So it's very important to keep those records. And I guess, you know, having a, having a good policy uh, on conflicts, uh, spelling out how people can comply and what non-compliance might look like and the mm. consequences of not complying uh, are also important. And we have, I, even if I say so myself, a very good template conflict of interest policy on the ACNC website. It's very simple um, and it states that if the board has a reason to believe that a person subject to the policy has failed to comply with it, it will investigate the circumstances. If it has found that this person has failed to disclose a conflict of interest, the board may take action against them. And there should be a clear set of actions the charities board can take to follow up non-compliance. And yeah. your policy should also make clear uh, what happens if a person suspects that a board member has failed to disclose a conflict of interest. And I must say I've observed uh, often um, where there are obviously conflicts of interest by one responsible person and perhaps uh, the other four or five board members have sat silent throughout the process. And yeah. I know it can be awkward um, if you're a new board member to sort of challenge people in these circumstances, but it is your duty as a responsible person to act in the best interest of the charity and uh, with care and dil diligence. And you'll be doing the right thing by alerting the charity to, to the risk of a conflict not being disclosed. So speak up. Definitely. And look, just an, another point that's been raised by um, one of our attendees today, it's, it's well worth emphasising too. When we talk 
conflicts of interest and, and all of these issues that we've discussed, um, should they apply beyond the board? Oh yeah, definitely they should apply beyond the board. All of these things, all of these things should. Um, this sort of stuff needs to be implemented. Obviously the, the board, the responsible people, the decision makers, you know, it's, it's that very clear, visible sort of thing. But look, if there are people in, in a charity that um, do have conflicts, Yes, they and, and they're not responsible people. They're not on the board or the committee. Yeah, they need to, they need to declare them. They should be identifying them. They should be disclosing them. Um, it should be on the record. That, that's what it's about. It's about transparency. It's about being on the record about these things. And again, taking that view of um, what a reasonable person would think, standing outside your organisation, if you didn't do it, if you didn't declare it, if you didn't note it down, again, to, to use the old saying, someone might think there's something dodgy happening and you don't want that. So yeah, it's, we, we obviously here are talking very much responsible people, decision makers and all that, but very much so um, throughout an organisation that just these sorts of things should be occurring as well. Um, that's now, that's right, well, Chris. And look, yeah. look I, I, I just thought that uh, I'd mention another thing some charities do yes. is to have an overarching code of conduct that binds not only the responsible people but all employees and volunteers and that requires people to be ethical and to be transparent and uh, to identify conflicts that whether it's part of being a responsible person or being an employee or a volunteer so um, it, it's really important for the whole uh, organization as, as you've said. Definitely now we've got apart from the fact that we're we're skating close to uh, the hour mark. We have got one last example um, or case study to illustrate some of the steps in dealing with the conflict of interest. Now, what we'll do is we'll we'll endeavour to get through this relatively quickly um, so that we don't hold you up too much, but it's well worth sort of having a bit of a look at this uh, a bit, this example. And I've given you a preempting of the next slide again. Um, our case study. Monica is a member of the board of Arts Plus. Now Arts Plus is an organisation that promotes the arts in the suburbs of Darwin. These are mythical uh, organisations by the way, these aren't real. So um, we emphasise that at this point. Um, now Arts Plus's board is meeting to discuss the awarding of three scholarships for some talented young artists to attend a prestigious course all the way over in Perth. Now here's the thing, Monica's stepson is one of the candidates for the scholarship. So what are we what are we looking at here, Peter? Well, pretty clear, Chris, this is an actual conflict of interest, although a non-financial one, perhaps more a, a personal one. Um, what should Monica do? Well, she firstly identifies the conflict of interest as an issue. That's first great step. Yeah. Then she immediately discloses this to the rest of the board before the start of the next meeting, explaining that while she believes her son is talented and has a lot of potential, she couldn't objectively decide on whether he should receive a scholarship. That's excellent, um, exactly the way to do it, textbook disclosure. Yeah, and, and look now, there's the disclosure. Now, how does the board react? The board decides that when it's discussing candidates for the scholarship, um, Monica should leave the room. That way they can dus discuss candidates, including her stepson, um, openly and honestly. Now, again, this is good management of the, of the situation. Um, now, further to that, once the candidates have been selected, Monica is invited to return to the room and she's informed of the outcome of the decision making or the, the I guess, the discussion and the, and the decision. Now, final important step here, the conflict of interest and the action taken to address it are recorded in Arts Plus's register of interests. I, also again, we look at minutes as well, meeting minutes, who has declared the conflict of interest, who is in the room when the decision and the discussion is being made, who's not in the room, transparency, record keeping, all of those sorts of things. These are good, these are very good. This is uh, a conflict of interest being identified, disclosed, and managed. There's clear communication throughout, there's transparency and there's accountability. So th this is sort of the way to do it. This is a bit of a model towards what we should be doing um, when it comes to conflicts of interest. So with that example out of the way, some helpful tips just to take with you to, to finish up today's uh, session, I suppose. Uh, what, are the, what are the first couple we got here, Peter? 
Well, look, conflicts of interest can take many forms and can be actual, potential or perceived. They can be non-financial as well. So be aware of the different types of conflicts of interest so that you can more readily identify issues. And of course, conflicts of interest can cause reputational, operational and governance related risks if they're not disclosed properly or managed adequately. And what else, Chris? Um, we've mentioned these three steps identify and identification, disclosure and management. These are the three key steps in dealing with conflicts of interest. We've gone through them throughout this webinar. Um, take them as the three key words almost in, in many ways. Um, fourth one, consider both the reasonable person test or that stepping back outside your organisation test, I suppose, when weighing up whether something might be a conflict of interest. Um, you know, what would a reasonable person think? What would an unbiased outsider think? Uh, and a couple more, Peter. Yes, look, uh, have a clear conflict of interest policy that details how these issues are disclosed and managed. Uh, have clear disclosure policies and methods for managing conflicts of interest. And this should definitely include an interest register, which yeah. formally records interests, uh, whether they be potential, perceived and actual. And make sure the handling a conflict of interest is a key regular routine part of charity board meetings and decision making. So open, transparent and accountable and you can't go wrong. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, um, Normally here we'd say uh, we might grab a couple of questions. Now we've covered a couple of questions during today's proceedings and we've just reached the hour mark. So what we might do today is we might just uh, skip over the questions and uh, apologies. Um, as we've said, if you do have a pressing question in relation specifically to your charity, it's probably best to get in touch with the ACNC uh, directly. If you have a more general question about where things are at, uh, education at acnc.gov.au is the email address. Um, feel free to get in touch and I know that um, Bree and Matt and Michael have been answering quite a few queries there in the background so thank you uh, also to, to them. Um, look we're going to wrap up, we don't want to keep you from your the rest of your days. Um, thank you very much for attending, thank you very much for sticking with us for the uh, just over an hour. Um, on screen are some of the ways you can stay in touch with us. We've got a whole heap of guidance, publications, templates importantly as well for things like interest registers, conflicts of interest policies, those sorts of things. Um, we've got our um, charitable purpose uh, e-newsletter, um, podcasts, webinars and our advice services. There's the email address. We've also given you uh, the phone number if you need to get in touch with them as well. So. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for coming along today and giving us some insights with your compliance hat on. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. Um, and again, to Matt and to Michael and to Bree, who've been helping with the questions, handouts, links, all of that sort of stuff. Thanks for joining us. Um, our webinars page will be updated pretty soon with the next two or three webinars that are upcoming. Um, so please check in there, feel free to have a look and uh, sign up for future ones if you uh, feel the need. Uh, until next time, thank you very much, thanks again and hope you have a wonderful day. See you later, bye.